I'd just like to welcome everybody here tonight. My name is Michelle Pekansky Brock, and it's uh, fun to be back here at Pasadena City College. I already know a number of you from my last couple of visits here. And um, tonight's workshop is the Mobile Learning Think Tank, and this is a time for us all to come together and learn from one another. I really, really believe in the power of sharing as we move through this um, incredibly exciting and insane time in education as we scramble and try to figure out what we're supposed to do if, and how to do it effectively to um, create dynamic and high quality learning experiences for our students in this digital mobile society that we live in. So I'd like to say thank you first of all to Rachel Fermi for welcoming me back and yes, and all the work she has done for tonight, amazing. I, I'm, I stand in awe at all that Rachel gets done. And you know, it was Rachel's idea to actually dedicate this workshop to sharing, so I think that is really outstanding. Uh, you all have an agenda on, um, on your table, and um, the agenda is also posted on our Posterous group blog. And so we've integrated Posterous, which may be, how many of you have used Posterous before, anyone? Oh good, so it's something new for you, that's exciting. Um, it's new to me too, actually it's brand new, and so this is also experimental. But Posters is a blog site, I've set it up as a group blog site, and everyone who registered for the workshop has been added as a contributor, which means you can post to that blog. Talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but I have posted the agenda to Posters. The URL is mobilethinktank.posters.com, and it's projected up here on the wall mobilethinktank.posterist.com. If anyone does have a laptop, you want to check it out. You can also um, view the posts on the blog through your mobile, through your smart mobile device. And we have a few iPod touches tonight. If anybody wants to look at it on a, on a iPod touch tonight. Thank you. 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 Thank This conversation extends out of mobile ed nine and ten. How many of you attended at least one of those? All right. A number of you. And there's a lot of energy and many people were actually awarded with um, iPod Touches for registering and attending that event. So that was part of this conversation was, well, let's try to figure out what people are doing with those tools and come together and, and do a check-in. Um, this is the group blog, a, a, a screenshot of it here that you see. And I want to sh comment a little bit about the power and the importance of, um, of brainstorming. And I, I, Michael took a look at your slides, as we'll see soon, and it's, it's kind of a, an, an interesting balance that we have going on here. Um, so again, tonight is very much about brainstorming and coming up with ideas and thinking. And um, there's a, a Seth Godin, I don't know if you know who Seth Godin is, but he's an entrepreneur, marketing extraordinaire, and I subscribe to his blog, and he sends out these little posts every morning. I wake up to a little nugget from Seth Godin, and I have some, some pieces, uh, extractions from one of his posts here. He says that ideas fear experts, but they adore a beginner's mind. Ideas come from bad ideas, but only if there are enough of them. Ideas come in spurts until you get frightened. Ideas do their best when they're generous and selfless. And I'm sharing that with you all because that is really what this posterous site is all about. It's easy to post to posterous. All you have to do is send an email to post at mobilethinktank.posterous.com. So if you are here with a laptop or if you are here with a mobile device that has internet access, the ability to send an email, you should all have received an email notifying that you've been added as a contributor. And that means that you can send an email to that address and what you email will appear on our posterous blog. And it's a pretty powerful tool. So check it out and think about how that could also be used for teaching and learning. I'm seeing all kinds of interesting connections here. What you're seeing, the embedded agenda that's up on the wall here, um, here I can share it here. Uh, this is the agenda that I simply sent. I sent an email and I typed in, here is the agenda for the mobile learning think tank and I attached a PDF and it embeds it on its own. It's really pretty, very, very, very cool. And so there's already some content up here. I have a copy of the presentation I'm sharing here. And there's some other resources, as well as some descriptions of the presentations that you're going to hear today. The presenters were great to just share a little um, 
clip of their, of their idea. So again, think of posters as a bulletin board for ideas. And if an idea comes to you tonight during the workshop, send an email so that we can start to collect those ideas and build off of each other's. And it doesn't mean that it has to be a stellar idea. Ideas are important to grow upon and build new ideas. So um, that's my spiel about ideas and sharing. So how to view those blog posts, um, the screen up here, which is a little bit dim, but it is there. You can go to the blog itself, which again is at mobilethinktank.posterist.com. And the agenda, there's some information on the back of the agenda about that also, if you want to kind of take a closer look if I'm going too fast. You can also, if you're a tweeter, you can follow the, 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 the stream at Mobile Think, which is M-O-B-L Think. And if you do a search for that on Twitter, you'll be able to follow our posts also. So before you came here tonight, you were se um, sent a, a, a brainstorm form, which is what we called it. And we wanted to collect some information from everyone who was registering just to try to understand where you were at with your integration of mobile devices or mobile learning into, um, into teaching and learning. Uh, we sent that out, and we had uh, 22 responses, which was just about half of the folks replied, and I just had some feedback, some of the results that I wanted to share with you so we could get started here tonight. So we asked um, everyone, how do you feel about integrating mobile devices and social media into student learning? And um, of course, we're emailing a very engaged crowd, right? Because we're emailing people who signed up for this workshop. So um, as I look at these results, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to expand that crowd out to, to more people who aren't here and see how this would change. But it's great to see that um, out of everyone who replied, we didn't have anyone who felt reluctant or annoyed. Uh, this group is very excited, curious, and also a little bit overwhelmed. Um, and probably a mix of, of those at times, I would imagine. But that's, that's nice to see. And then we also took some poll, a poll to understand um, how you're all using mobile devices outside of learning, meaning on your own, and how or whether or not you've actually integrated those devices or other, other devices into student learning. So this color is a little hard to see here. Um, this color here, the top is blue, and the one below is um, it's a reddish color. And so the blue designates use outside the classroom, and the reddish color designates use for student learning. So if we go through each of these um, devices, smartphone, Google Apps, actually, Google Apps shouldn't be on that slide. Sorry about that. Um, that should have been on the social media slide. You, you can actually take a look here and see that there's much more buy-in outside the classroom than inside the classroom. However, I was still pretty darn impressed to see how many different things were being integrated into learning. I shouldn't say in the classroom. I should say into student learning overall. And we had about six or seven people say that um, none of them are actually being integrated yet into your students' learning. And then when it comes to social media, I ranked these in order based upon the ones that are being integrated the most heavily into student learning, okay? So the, the social media, YouTube, watching videos on YouTube is something that it seems like it has the most buy-in here. And also creating blogs, having students create blogs, which I found really interesting here because if you look at that, that's actually the only item where we see more integration to student learning than actually having the instructors blogging on their own. So that was a little bit intriguing to me. Um, and it moves down the line here a bit. A lot of in, um, integration also, or decent integration of reading blogs and sharing videos on YouTube and Facebook, but not nearly as much as going on outside of, in one's life outside of teaching. And here are the results for podcasts, listening and creating, the use of Skype, Twitter, and social bookmarking. And I've been reading a lot about Twitter being used for learning, and um, there's a lot of interesting dialogue going on around that as well. So those survey results, um, I know they're kind of complex, and I went through that pretty quickly, but I did share those to posterists, and so if you want to take a look at those later, later and kind of reflect on them on your own, they're there for you to do that. And with that said, we are now going to move into the rest of the evening where um, I won't be talking so much and you'll be hearing from our wonderful presenters.
And we're going to get started tonight with our first presenter, Michael Keeley from... Oh, is it Kylie? I apologize. That's what happens when you converse over email, right? Yeah. Michael Kylie. Okay, I'm going to have to remember that. Um, and Michael and I have been conversing over email for it, oh, not that long, a week or so, but it feels like longer than that. And he's really been engaged with quite a bit of transformation in his class um, just this past semester, right? Since last yeah, spring. Yeah, I taught for 11 years, and I just actually saw Michelle speak about five months ago. And I went on a binge. And I changed everything, and it's been amazing. It's been amazing. So, for those of you at home, Michael's just shared that um, he's been teaching for 11 years, and heard a presentation that actually I gave at Loyola last uh, May. I remember because it was on my birthday, actually, and uh, I went through quite a. a an innovative stage with his teaching after 11 years of teaching it and you'd be actually pretty floored to see what he's done. I'm, I'm quite amazed and I'm very excited that he's agreed to, to be here tonight and um, he's going to be speaking on the topic is ideas do grow on tea, trees or teas. Ideas do grow on, tr grow on trees using the visual structure of mind maps to encourage expansive thinking and successful brainstorming. So what I'm going to do here is share his presentation, which is on SlideShare. And for those of you at home, I'm going to do a full screen share here, and you may need to resize your screen a little bit. If you mouse over the upper left corner of your screen, you should see um, um, an option to condense the size, and it'll, it'll scroll to fit your, your desktop. So hopefully that you'll be able to see this okay. So if you want to come on up, Michael, I'm going to hand this over to you. Hi, um, Michael Kiley. Uh, yeah, I really did get into this suddenly. I've taught a class called Visual Thinking for 11 years, which I'm lucky. I don't think the people at Loyola know quite what the class is about. It's become a class about contemporary art, fairly avant-garde contemporary art, and what I call tactical creativity. So the big part of the class is getting students to be more creative, and most of my students aren't art majors. Um, and we used to have a section of my class that was art majors and one that was everybody else. And I couldn't tell the difference because uh, <laughs> the thing I've learned is that everyone that says I'm a terrible artist, what they mean is I don't draw dogs and kittens very well. And I had a school psychologist once tell me what a rotten artist I was. But since I was rebellious, I went ahead and sort of became an artist anyway. So it's really been an enjoyable class. And just in this, this semester, I spent the summer rethinking my pedagogy. I went through everything I'd been doing, and it had been a good class, and it was exciting to start to incorporate wikis and voice thread um, and everything else. So I've always taught brainstorming, and it seems like that's not really taught as a skill. It's just sort of, sort of oh, we know what that idea is. And in the last five years, I've also taught mind mapping and uh, how many of you are familiar with mind mapping? And have, it's one thing, you sort of see them sometimes, and then the process is really simple. So let me just go through what happened to me. I had kind of an aha moment two, two weeks ago. I was teaching these two things separately, and then I went, oh, it's so much better to teach, like the mind map is the perfect structure to brainstorm. What I used to do, um, a classic brainstorming exercise is called crossing a chasm. And I draw two cliffs, and I say it's 100 feet between them and 300 feet deep. And in nine minutes, I need 100 ideas about how you might cross the chasm. And I could probably do that because I'm very lateral, lateral but the students sort of stuck. And then what you have to do to get them to, go to its expansiveness, you have to sense and destroy their sense of limits. So four minutes in, I'm always like, oh, you assumed you were crossing a chasm on Earth. Oh, you assumed that you were mortal, you know, so it's just like that. And we have like one of the things I like to say is, you know, how would the most evil person in the planet cross the chasm? So let me go. Uh, this is a tree. I'm also a furniture maker, so I'm kind of trees and wood are really important to me. Um, and this all kind of gelled, and I hope it, hope it makes sense to you. I'm here, mobile device. Um, I'm a big, big iPhone fan. And I use something called MindNode. Um, which is an app for the iPhone. And what I like, there's much more elaborate ways to mind map, but I like MindNode because it's so simple. And I'll get into like ways to sort of elaborate on this. All a mind map is, is 
you put a bubble or an oval in the middle, and then it's important you use sensuous, curving, colored lines. It's important. And you start to categorize. And I'm somebody that tends to skip around, and what I need is to look at the whole and, and, and then begin to have some order. So let me just go to the next. I think you can read this, but mind map is a diagram used to organize words, ideas, and images. And the, the key thing is it's holistic and hierarchical. So I had a student last week say, well, I like this mind mapping, but I'm a big list person, and the mind mapping's kind of messy, especially when you hand draw it. And she said, I, I need something more organized. And I said, a mind map is a higher level of order than a list, because it's prioritizing. Um, they're used to generate ideas, visualize structure, classify ideas, uh, aid in study. So for instance, I don't think I can do it in real time, but I might take notes for this session in a mind map on my phone, because it's just more efficient for me, and I'll remember it better. Great for problem solving and decision making. So we all assume we know what brainstorming is. This is what I think it is, a generative flow state. I always have to get people to stop criticizing themselves and being practical and thinking, how much does that cost? So it's like, set that aside, set aside the rational mind. The goal is just to have as many ideas as possible. And these aren't ideas about implementation. So you need some ridiculous ideas. You need some absurd ideas. You need some ideas that you like, no, I'd never do that. And in having those absurd ideas, when you come back and do something, if you're planning a vacation, you'll go on a better trip. Quantity matters. It's all, always, people are so afraid they want this high quality idea. Frank Lloyd Wright, he said modestly for one moment in his life, he said, I'm not so much smarter than other people, but I start all problems immediately and I have a huge trash can. So it's that fear, you know, like just have a bad idea, embarrass yourself, throw the bad idea, I'm already ahead of the game. It's about richness over rightness and I, I like to be right, but you gotta have a lot of error. Here's how I started after my email with Michelle. This messy thing was how I started thinking about, I was like, oh, mobile device idea, what will I do? I was kind of puzzled. So it took me a little while, and I used a mind map to generate it. And so rather than making a list, it's a loose structure when you hand draw them. They're, you know, they're, I'll show you an example later. They're fun to draw, and I like, I like it on my iPhone. Sometimes that's the handiest thing, but I really prefer to hand draw them, sorry. Types of mind maps. This is one my student did a couple weeks ago. So when we first mind map, it's such a simple process. I say, draw an oval, put 10 sinuous, colorful arms out from it, write the word happiness in the middle, and then think about what the limbs of happiness are. And I had one student that put people on all the limbs, and I was like, no, people is one limb, and then family is a limb, and, or a branch, and friends. So again, it's hierarchical. And I loved how you can't get that with a digital process. I love how uh, euphoric that is. It looks happy. Here's the, this isn't the same mind map. Here's, here's mind node. It's really great. You don't even have to read the instructions. It's, I don't, it's like, you know, it's like probably some $4 app. You just, it, it, when, you, when you start a new mind map, you, it says there's a blank oval in the middle. And then all you do is touch and drag a limb. And then you just type something in for that limb. It's really great and easy. And then when Michelle inspired me in May, then I said I'm going to revolutionize my course. And then this is how I, this is how I planned it was with this, this mind map, um, which I started on my iPhone. And then I, easy, easy to put that right onto my Mac. And then I can collage in photographs and then make branches and add these sort of dashed lines to start to form relationships. The ultimate goal of my interest in technology and distance learning is to move to Barcelona so I can teach people everywhere. Um, <laughs> let's see if that works out. And then, no fantastic response to this, but I, I send a regular resume when I'm sending out, you know, looking for more teaching work, but I also send this hyperlinked mind map. And I can email this to you as a PDF and when you click on, I could put every note of this hyperlinked, and I have a lot of blogs and websites, and I have thousands of photo pages, 
And when you click on it, it'll go to it. It'll even go to a text resume on mine so I can keep it updated. Maybe that's scaring people. Maybe I'm not hearing back on this, but, <laughs> but screw them. I need, I need them to respond. Students can explore the advantage of each type of mapping, so it's not one versus the other. Mobile device, you can use it anywhere. It's so simple. There's no need for instructions. Everyone gets it. Easy to export to a computer. My node, I guess, is just Mac-based. I'm sure there's other things, maybe less attractive things for PCs. Um, <laughs> take, it, take it on to the... Sorry. Yeah. Um, for more complex explorations, I export it work it, and then I can, I can sort of send it and keep it with me on my phone. It's easy to add images, uh, and then the hyperlinking is really a great feature because, I, you know what I love about visual experience is you look at a painting, if it's a great painting, you get the whole thing in a second, and then if it's a really great work of art, you could look at it for 30 years on your living room wall, and 30 years later you could go, wow, I just saw something. So that's what I like about the visual experience uh, and the summation. And then the hand-drawn mind maps are free and loose. You feel like a little kid. This is the, uh, this is the analog mind mapping kit I give my kid. Students has, you know, they're sophisticated 22-year-olds, but they love this. They have like felt pens and they have instructions for my, a mind map explaining how to mind map. Okay. And then you could sketch a collage and you could also you know, you could, you could print out the computer version and you could collage, I love photo montage, you could collage images onto it. Uh, so all you do is you draw an oval. Here's my really ugly mind map. This is so, how bad I draw. You just draw an oval, you draw limbs reading out from it as many colors as possible. And then one thing that makes the creation of a mind map useful is you have to limit to one word if you follow the real strict mind mapping philosophy. So what's that word? And then the, the limbs need to be a word. And sometimes it's very hard to find that word for a complex thought. And that tends to produce clarity and movement. And also, a single word, it's poetic. It collides with another word. And it, it creates this suggestibility, which is what is also the essence of creativity. Um, you write in block letters. And then as you expand out. <laughs> You bifurcate, you just add little forks on the branches, and it's just, uh, I swear, it's like when you start drawing the curving lines and the color, it, it switches something on. Uh, what can you do with this? You can brainstorm efficiently. You can discover patterns and relationships out of a whole list of ideas. Often brainstorming is just a list of ideas. Um, you could map a learning experience like this. Plan a presentation, which I just did. Um, and then visual, hierarchical, holistic. I think that's the, the key thing there. And then there's some reason we keep seeing it in nature, um, this bifurcation. Um, and my main idea, I guess I have it here, is if you want to expand your creativity, start an idea on a, on a limb of a mind map, and then bifurcate it many times and force yourself to fill in the blanks. I, I used to use a thing that was just a grid um, so in a brainstorming exercise, I gave this grid of, well, maybe it was, I don't know, 40, 40 spaces on several pages. And I said, you have to fill in the whole grid. And that forces people to not stop at idea number three. What happens in most, most settings is you're faced with a problem, important or not important. You look for some solution. And as soon as you find something that's pretty good, you go with it, and that's not the most productive thing. If you had a list of 50 choices and then chose, in most cases, you'll end up in a far better place. Um, Einstein said he spent something like the first 30 or 40% of time faced with a problem, redefining the problem and not accepting the question and reframing the question. So I just think this of, here's my big idea. I'm going to force it. I'm going to force myself to have 30. 30 variations. This is sort of the same thing. It's like a flow chart of an idea. Spread, spread. There's a reason I think ideas grow like this. Rivers are like this at their delta. Trees grow like this. There's something about growth. And eventually an idea falls off of where you began and a whole new branch um, happens, which you can do with a mind map. Um, hybridization is a great way to create new ideas. 
I'm a great random thinker. It's hard for me to be linear and present ideas in a way that makes sense to people. Um, so I just took, you know, the left is sort of half of a mind map that says goat, pig, chicken. And the other side, I just put strange feelings. So the goat has reckless envy. The pig is indignation. The chicken's all about platonic love. And the owl has obsessive introspection. So mix unlike things leading to unexpected and fresh results. And we see that all the time in fine art. I think most of the great artists and the controversial artists, they do that all the time. They, I think humor also does that. They, Twist, twists you. Uh, I, these links aren't working, but anyway, they're a good idea. When I think of the apps I'm using, MindNode, there's I mind map by the guy Tony Buzan. You really got to see this guy. He believes he invented the mind map, and <laughs> I'll let him believe that. And he's made a fortune from it, but I don't really think he invented it. So you have to see the Tony Buzan system. He's a great speaker. He does all these things with his hands, like convey ideas to you. Um, <laughs> Free mind, I dabbled with. It's free, it's cross-platform. Thought it was kind of complicated, which is the last thing I want in a mind map. A bit slow, didn't give it that good a try. And then Thinking Space is an Android app. I don't have an Android device, so I haven't tried it, but it might be interesting. I'm sure there's, there's going to be more and more of this. And then I learned everything, all, the, all that I know about mind maps, I learned from two books. Um, and this is the Tony Buzan book, which really is a good book. And I'll have that link working somewhere. And then this is another book. This woman doesn't think she invented mind mapping, but uh, Mapping Inner Space, it's a really great, just a great book. And, and also these books, this one particularly is just fun to look at. And there's sort of this, I often encounter this, like just because it's fun doesn't make it like dumb or useless or unimportant. So and that's all I have to say. I, that's my, my class is at this learnvisualthinking.com and then I've been keeping a, <laughs> a journal for six months about my ed tech explorations and I hope I didn't put, I had this one time I was just having like a breakdown over. I just spent, you know, 35 hours getting ready to have my students produce their first wiki, so more working for free. <laughs> so that's about, I mean, all. Um, we have Q&A time built in after each presentation, and so this is an opportunity to just ask. There's always questions. How did you, what would you, anything like that that, that you're thinking right now, this is an opportunity to bounce that off of Michael and, and, and see what... Were you, were you able to get your whole plan put in place before class started? Uh -huh. Or did yes. you, you uh, started and then were... Yes, I lied. No, I, I, I was trying to do that, and when I did that big mind had, I went to a great, I went to Edu SoCal in San Diego, and that was just incredible for me. And so I had 80 technologies I was thinking of using. And in my mind map about the part that was about learning, not about being a tech geek, I, my, my mantra was technology must always be in service of learning. And so I really cut that list, and as much as I felt like kid in a candy store, I basically said I'm starting, well, Michelle exposed me to VoiceThread, which I love. I just immediately loved it. So I said, I'm starting with VoiceThread. I'm going to exhaust it. I'm going to, I'm going to, when in doubt, do everything in VoiceThread. And then what happened was, yeah, as I kind of got into reality, um, we used wikis, which most of my students had never used in terms of creating and collaborating. Um, somebody I met at the Edu SoCal conference gave me an idea I'd never had, which was to have, even though I only teach a class of 14 students, I broke them into sub-teams, and that was also amazingly powerful. And these teams were for the whole semester, and they wrote these wikis that were incredible, and then we recorded podcasts. So the technology, so and cool. the technology really, when I talk to people that are naive about it, they're always like, oh, you mean you're gonna like correspond with your students with email and be sort of aloof and treat them like a number? I'm like, oh yeah, right. The first time, while my students were watching a film, the first time I listened through the voice threads and it was like a just magic, magic moment of like, I knew them so much better and faster. So yeah, it was, and just a few weeks ago I had to hit that like, this is all I get to do this semester, so wait till next semester. Also my school doesn't know what I'm doing and 
I'm a little afraid of publicizing it too much there because there's a little bit of a sense of excellence will be punished. So, I mean, this may be my paranoia, but um, I'm really glad that no one interfered with me. I tried to work through channels a bit, but they weren't, uh, the technology wasn't really happening and I couldn't understand why I would use the systems version of a wiki that didn't work as well. So, no, it's really been, it's been, I, I loved my class all along, but this just took it up like turbocharge. So, thanks. One thing question from the audience of the presenter, and I know this feels unnatural, but if you could paraphrase the question before you answer it, yeah, yeah. so the mic picks it up, that would be great. Okay. So who else has a question for Mike? Yeah. What did you say the name of the course was? The name of my course is Visual Thinking, and it's a course in perception, culture, which is contemporary art culture, and creativity. I call it tactical creativity, because a lot of people, there's so many myths about creativity, I've written about that. People think it's like this thing just for artists, or this vague thing, and it's, see, I think the most important skill in education is problem solving ability, and that to me means like better creative skills. So I think what I'm doing is world, and, you know, just gonna save the world. There was a, there was a recent uh, poll, IBM, IBM conducted a poll of 1,500 CEOs and asked, you know, what skills are you seeking in your new employees? And the number one skill was creativity. So absolutely, 21st century skill for solving the world's problems. And, and General Motors didn't turn in time, but two years before they went bankrupt, their number two man, who was an old-time auto company guy and former military guy, he was being interviewed about what he was going to do with General Motors and they said, what kind of cars? You've got to change and improve the company. What kind of cars are you going to make? And he said, we're not a car company. We're a moving sculpture company. <laughs> and that was so profound. And if only he had more time, I think it would have maybe put them in a better position if he had been there about three years earlier. Hmm. So I'm yeah. just curious, are, are you like playing games with them in terms of exploration, or like, like developing strategies to dealing with information and problems, or are they actually doing projects? Or is They're asking me what we do in the visual thinking yeah. class. We actually make art okay. um, to learn about art, and, I, and, I, and, I've design, and I've designed all the projects to work and sort of turn on anybody, so I'm not very interested in representational art myself, but that's the turnoff for people, even though I think it's a wonderful skill to have. So the things are like sort of advanced craft projects. I'm, my art had most recently been in studio furniture, fine art furniture, so we're more likely, we just did a project called chair transformation. I give them a blank chair this tall made out of black foam core, and we talk about <clears throat> creativity, and it becomes a physical manifestation of come back in seven days with that chair so transformed that I can't even catch my breath when I look at it. And I much prefer to look at the object. And yeah, you, a, a class called visual thinking could be a class about watching TV commercials and critiquing media and writing essays. And I'm sure somebody could teach a wonderful class like that, but it wouldn't be me. I really believe in, I've been involved in art for years. I believe in a direct experience. And if an artist has to tell me too much about the art, then I don't think it's successful. So uh, all the projects I do, it seems like almost everyone gets engaged in them. And I think that's the learning, the practice for how to be more creative, which I hope will manifest not to making beautiful little absurd chairs, but to, I, I give them this, I teach these 16 tactics I've gathered about creativity. I give it to them on a business card and I tell them, don't burst my bubble, but my fantasy is in four years you'll have a really severe problem and pull this card out. And if you do one of these tactics, you'll probably be at a better place with even a really difficult problem. So. Any questions? Well, I encourage everyone to think Michael's right about his podcast idea because it has quite a few questions. <laughs> 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 and I guess one of the things I'd say about technology that I've found is. Um, just when it feels like it's all spinning out of control and about to explode, you know you're doing something right. <laughs> like, 
it's, it's a, and that's generally true of creativity. It's good if you enjoy feeling disoriented or you don't mind getting lost. Those are good things for creativity. Thank you very much. Thanks. So at Mobile Ed 9 and 10, we had um, Eileen Clegg attend. And she has her own company, which I believe is called Visual Thinking. I, I, yeah. Anyway, but she did mind mapping throughout the entire conference. So every group session, she was up there live. And it was, it was not exact, I don't know, it was, I guess it was a mind map, but it was amazing. I mean, I would say that the whole time I was going, oh, it's staring. Visual, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a better description, visual journaling, yeah. Okay, so let me um, move on over to our next presenter. And next we have Lori Rush. How do you say your name, Lori? Rush, Lori Rush, who I'm very excited to have here this evening. And you are going to present tonight on, her topic is, Welcome to Our Classroom, Dr. Spivey. And um, she shared a description already on Posteris, but I'm going to let you tell the full story because it's really, really a fun one. Thank you for being here, Lori. Thank you so much. I've been um, stalking Michelle virtually for a while now, um, mainly because I am not a natural techie in any way, but I am an art historian. And when I found Michelle and her blog and found out that not only did she have all these great ideas, but she, that we had a common a common love for, for art and the t uh, history of teaching art, I was all over her. So I have to tell you about this wonderful adventure that I had. Um, I am a, a freeway flyer, like so many of you, and I teach at Citrus College, and I also teach at the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts that's located on the campus at Cal State LA. LOXA, it's a short name, is a uh, portfolio admittance school. It has a, a drama program, a music program, a vocal program, and a visual arts program. Um, our students come from literally every corner of Los Angeles, from Ontario to Lancaster, from Malibu to the borderline with Long Beach. They get up at 5, 5.30 in the morning. They take public transportation into Cal State LA. They take a full course of academic classes in the morning, and then they have a block of studio classes in the afternoon. They have five different studio classes that they take, a different instructor every day. I teach in the studio block. So where you need two hours and 45 minutes to do uh, life drawing or to work on a film project or to make ceramics, nobody wants to listen to me talk for two hours and 40 minutes about the history of art. I find that shocking, but you know, <laughs> the sound of my own, own voice can only get me so far. So one of the things that um, when I began to teach there several years ago, I realized I needed to fill our time with more than the standard lecture format. Um, Last year's group of students was exceptional in every way, and they, uh, they took me on a ride I was not prepared for. So what I'm going to tell you about is a, a, uh, an, a really wonderful experience we had interviewing uh, an academic from Cambridge in our lowly little classroom at Cal State LA. So let me tell you first about the exquisite core. Now this is, uh, art history is full of inside jokes, and if you come up to me during the break, I'll tell you um, the derivation of this name. This is, a, a, this is what I, I call my group of students, whether my current students or my past students. And so this is a way of, um, it's kind of a strange competition at my school between the drama kids and, oh, here comes the visuals, and she sings, you know. So having, being together but being separate is sort of an interesting little thing that goes on. So this is the way that we, uh, we communicate with each other. We have extremely diverse student body. We have kids who've had private oil painting lessons in their home to kids who've never set foot in a museum before, kids who have tremendous technological uh, opportunities at home, and kids who have zero. So it's, it's wonderful. And the comparison of teaching uh, visually driven high school students as opposed to, for example, teaching um, art majors uh, at Cal State LA, where I've also been a lecturer, is that these kids just come in like a sponge and they get it. They get why they're in the study of art history immediately. Whereas my art majors who are a little bit older, they're like, oh, hoop. This is a hoop. I have to jump through. This is a hoop. This isn't about art until I'm done with them. And then they get it. So um, 
they're, uh, they're just amazingly talented intellectually and in every other way as well. We begin the world art class, which is a college credit class. They get four units of college credit for taking a year's worth of world art history with me. So we start in the caves, just like everybody does. And there happens to be a uh, wonderful documentary series called How Art Made the World. This is how I finish our class. Uh, by the time uh, we finished with our, our uh, talk together, it's time to chill. It's uh, 3 o'clock. It's almost 4. They go until 4 in the afternoon, and most of them have been up by 12, for 12 hours by then. Um, we finish with a film. So this series was uh, created in conjunction with doc Dr. Nigel Spivey, who, if you're an art historian, knows, has written great scholarly work on the Etruscans, on ancient Rome, um, all things that they're from the, the ancient world. He also is quite personable, a very animated, and he's not a stodgy British professor in any way. So he's just very fascinating. This particular series marries science with art and about how humans are hardwired in their art making skill. So we show these films through the course of the few, first few weeks and I kept hearing about Nigel. You know, are we gonna, Ms. Rush, are we going to hear more from Nigel today? So we got on a first name basis with Nigel right away. Um, they were absolutely obsessed with him, and they were obsessed with his scientific ideas as they related to art most of all. Um, I would recommend this series to you regardless of your discipline. There's a great film that's wonderful to show um, during the political season about, about uh, propaganda in the time of Alexander. This has many, many applications. We were moving on. We were already in Asia, and I was still hearing about Nigel. And I said, well, you know, you guys, I have an idea. Why don't we send him an email, and maybe he'd get back to us. And they're like, why would he do that? I said, well, I said, he's a teacher. You know, he, he, he might appear to you to be kind of a highfalutin teacher, but, but he still is interested in education. So, so why, don't you, uh, why don't you work in the, on that and see what happens? So two of my most eager students, Asher and Tucker, commute from Northridge every day. And they composed a marvelous letter uh, to Dr. Spivey inviting him uh, to speak with us. So uh, I want to read you a quick uh, part. I had, to, I had to edit it down. It was quite long. Your excellent descriptions of how art has had such a profound influence on the world has compelled us to ask you one important question. Would it be possible for you to participate in a video conference? Now, these kids are barely 14 years old, okay? So, so uh, all I had to do was make it shorter. I found his email, his Cambridge email, poor man, anyone can find it. And I, I said, they said, do you really think he's going to answer? I said, you know, I bet he will. Well, not only did he answer, he answered right away. And he said, well, of course, Los Angeles, I fondly remember my time at the Getty. da 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 <laughs> And so he said, I printed out uh, the letter, and it's posted on my refrigerator at home. Turns out his children are the same age as my students, so, so he got it right away. That was, we were ready to roll, uh, talking about how we were going to do it. That was in December. It took months and months and months at an institution the size of Cal State LA, which has 30,000 students, which could talk to Mars if they wanted to, could not provide me with a hardwired room and a tech support that seated 100 people. Couldn't be done. Well, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just a lowly freeway flyer who's working for this strange anomaly on this great large campus. So I thought, well, I, there was no way I was going to let these students down. It, it had to happen. Um, about that time, I heard about the mobile ed conference, and then I saw the word Skype on there. I said, well, you know what? I think I can do Skype. So I came to the conference. I, I forced me to go buy the droid. You know, I gave up my 10-year-old my Nokia, which was the hardest part of the whole experience, bought my droid, came to the conference, learned about Skype, and much to my uh, pleasant surprise, the person we were interviewing for our test call was in London. And that was great. And so um, I learned about Skype. Meanwhile, uh, Dr. Spivey said, well, I don't know anything about any of this. I said, well, someone in your campus must or ask your 12-year-old, and you'll get it all worked out. <laughs> when we decided, we decided on Skype, I did some practicing. He said, I'm going to be taught. I said, great. So then I was able to tell the students, because if I hadn't been able to work this out, it would have been a crushing disappointment to everyone involved. 
Next, we establish a Facebook page for our group, The Exquisite Core. I have no way to communicate with these guys. I'm not a regular teacher. I do not have access to the school's website. I just have no way but standard email to talk to my students outside of class. So I basically risked my profession <laughs> and established a Facebook page, which I did some research and I saw people were so horrified about having a Facebook page with minor children. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to give it a go. And I, did, I was, um, I can monitor it, I can take things away, I can add things to it. I had, in six months, I've had one untoward post which I immediately removed. I gave them the prompt, please begin to list the potential questions you have for Dr. Spivey, submit only respectful questions about his career. Come to Nigel, Nigel Fest, da 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 da. So then they started on, on the right their questions. They started to dialogue with each other and on and on and on and then they self-edited Five, seven, and eight seem a little redundant and can probably be combined into one or two questions. And it was like, uh, so I just sat back. I, I virtually had to do nothing. We had a film festival at lunchtime where everybody brought their, their sack lunch and we sat down and we reviewed the films together um, as part of getting accessed for it. Now, this is marvelous. I had to get someone to explain this to me. Nigel Spivey can slam a revolving door. Evidently, that is a Chuck Norris reference that I was not familiar with. So this is part of the, um, the campaign that the students came up with to publicize what was going on. Anticipation grows. Uh, on the right here, you see a, a familiar image of God uh, giving life to Adam from the Sistine Chapel. In fact, did you know that it was Dr. Spivey who gave life to Adam? I didn't know that. Uh, on the right here is a, is, an, is a wonderful sheet cake baked by my students on a Sunday and decorated with hand-colored frosting applied with a paintbrush. And it is, in fact, a rendering of Dr. Spivey himself. And we ate it up after we took pictures of it, and it was quite delicious. I, you know, these are the, the flyers that the kids put up to make sure everybody knew. We had a terrible time finding a date for this little event. We had to get 500 uh, pieces of permission to use a room on a, on a Friday morning. The students have late start on Friday, and I don't know if you know anything about teenagers, but any time that they don't have to get up before they have to get up, they're not going to get up. I was asking them to be at school two hours early uh, on a Friday when they didn't have to. And um, one particular naysayer, uh, uh, and they said, well, if you don't make it mandatory, you're going to have two students there. I said, I don't think so. I don't think so. So you see here, we uh, many references uh, to the arts here, the, the Riace Warrior and the Venus of Wollendorf, something for everyone. <laughs> Art made you. Nigel Fest is here. The morning, uh, the fateful morning arrived. I, um, you know how it is. Tech support, the tech, where was none? It was me. Um, things tend to go wrong at the time when it's least convenient, as we all know. So, so once again, I had, I had my ex exquisite core. They're, they're, they were riding on me to pull this off. I got there early, I set up my computer, I Skyped my daughter in San Diego from her dorm room as my test call. I'm like, are you sure you can hear me? Yes, mom, I can hear you. Are you sure you can see me? Yes, mom, I can see you. Okay, good. So we signed off with her. By this time, what I didn't tell you was when I showed up at 745, there was already 15 kids sitting on the floor outside the locked classroom door. <laughs> Tears were starting up. Like, okay, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Um, this uh, young gentleman, who's a little hard to see here, he even dressed as Dr. Spivey dresses in his presentations. He wears a blue cambray shirt and khaki pants, and so he, he dressed the part. Um, certain kids had to ask a question. A couple of them um, had to be coerced. They just did little three by five with bullets points. They had rehearsed a little bit, and we just sat down, and we, we pressed the button, and we heard this, hello, Laurie. <laughs> and I said, Dr. Spivey, I said, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Let's, and so I instructed, I instructed him, the PhD, can you imagine, on how to make himself visual to us. Um, his face came up. Big problem was we were in a room with too much light. So we didn't have a wonderful uh, image of him, but we knew what he looked like. We didn't need to, we didn't need to see it. It was 5 o'clock in the afternoon, his time, 9, 9 a.m., our time. It was quite perfect. Um, 
I did the, just a very brief uh, log on with him. We had an introduction made by a young woman who spent the first five years of her life in Britain, so we used her as our translator so that everyone would understand. And she introduced uh, Dr. Spivey and, and explained his credentials with her beautiful British accent. And then the kids took over. And they were, they, they were so excited. Um, I even had a parent come, which is unusual for someone to drive all the way from the San Fernando Valley to hear a, a presentation. I, I was on top of the world for the whole weekend after that. It was just absolutely the most wonderful experience. He answered their questions quite perfectly. Um, they were able to think on the fly for, for a follow-up question. Um, it was just absolutely the most the one, wonderful experience that, that you can imagine. Um, I, would, I would encourage you to, uh, to try something like that. The applications are far-reaching. It could work uh, quite beautifully with anyone you wanted to talk to, anyone in the world. Certainly for um, the older students at the college level, they could do it in smaller groups on their own time. Um, uh, current working artists in my field would be a great way to interview someone that you, that you couldn't uh, get in front of you. Uh, personal interviews that you would then report back to the larger class. And it was all free and it was just as easy as it could be. And they're still talking about Dr. Spivey. Thank you. Spivey like ivy, and he said, actually, Lori, there's a tremendous amount of spiveys in North Carolina, but nowhere else in your country. I wouldn't expect you knew how to say my name. So I had been telling the students the wrong way. I pride myself on correct pronunciation. I want my kids to know how to say these terms, and they had like 48 hours to retrain their, their heads, and they, they did a fine job. So that was a small pitfall, but uh, anyway, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience. I like it. That's great. <laughs> Congratulations. That's wonderful. And I think the the pleasant part is I guess I wasn't surprised at how receptive he was, but I was just so pleased, you know. I, I was I had it in my heart. I knew I said, this guy's a teacher. You know, he's a teacher and I knew I knew he'd love it. And um, with, with a bunch of kids this enthusiastic, you know, I had 75 kids sitting there. I had a parent write me a letter afterwards that said, you know, th this kind of enthusiasm is something that's reserved for uh, celebrities and rock stars. And to see it applied to an academic for kids who are 14, 15, 16 years old, they're never going to forget that. So that's why we're there. That's why we're there. Thank you. Who are you targeting for your next adventure? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. I was asked who my. There's no way we could top this, but um, there's a gentleman named Peter Weller. I don't know if you've ever seen a little film called Robocop. Uh, Professor Weller happens to have a master's degree from Syracuse, and he does a fabulous uh, series called Engineering and Empire, uh, where he is the moderator. I just found out he's getting his PhD at UCLA. Wouldn't that be handy? Maybe we'll have a real time, an old school uh, interview. But that would be my follow up. So watch out, Peter Weller. <laughs> so, what I'm reflecting on now, and I know I should send an email, but I'm going to share it here. <laughs> yeah, send those emails. Yeah, here are ideas coming. So, um, how many rules she broke? Mm -hmm. Yeah, old school. Yeah. Yeah. But seriously, and how you needed to do that to create this incredibly relevant learning experience that was completely driven by student engagement. I mean, there's, there's something pretty powerful about that, right? Um, that's what, I was almost counting them in, as you were going through. And, but you made so many important um, notes there about not having access to anything other than email and how am I supposed to how am I supposed to cultivate this kind of untethered learning experience, which is what learning is about in 2010, when as a teacher you're only given tools that allow you to communicate through email. So that's really powerful. And just your willingness to take a risk and rely that much on technology. And I mean, it, that's really amazing. Yeah. Michelle, I, I wanted to mention in my online class, it wasn't the same level, but I had um, an outstanding professional come in to um, a synchronous chat um, and talk to my students. It was, it was called um, Talk to a Photographer. The whole unit was about photography and they had done initial work. And um, the famous, fabulous photographer who came in uh, and uh, texted with my students was really for me. <laughs> <laughs> 
so and, it's, and the students loved it, so that's me. And it was to Blackboard right. in the chat room. And they loved it, and Rachel was fabulous. That's great. So, so for those of us listening remotely, um, Sandra has, Haynes has just shared that she had did a similar thing in her online class, which involved a chat with a, um, a professional photographer coming in and chatting with their students. So, you know, I think about this as teaching without walls. That's that's what this is all about. And the more we can, I mean, literally, I think about if, if we get everyone, every teacher, to think about, you know, envision literally, literally, your classroom not having walls. How would that change the way that your students are learning? And I think that that's just a beautiful demonstration of that. So, bravo. Um, well, with that said, we are at our break time. So um, it is 8.15 now. And what time is our break scheduled to go till? 8.30? 8.30. Okay, so we're going to take a 15-minute break and reconvene at 8.30. So everyone, um, go stretch your legs. Have a cup of coffee if you'd like. Get some fresh air. So before we jump back into our presentations, I wanted to take a couple minutes to take a look at Posterous, and I'm excited to see that we have a couple of new posts there. Um, when you post to Posterous, you're going to notice that you're actually not identified unless you put your name in it. So I don't know who the top post is from. Uh, oh, great. And I'm sorry, what, what I'm, Pat? Okay, Pat. So um, if we take a look down below, we have a post here from Catherine who has shared. And I know Catherine. Catherine is, um, it, it teaches and it is, a, is it, um, it, on the, I, Catherine, I'm going to mess up your webmaster. I think that's what your title is over at Cuesta College. And she also teaches lots of different wonderful tools um, about social media for students. And so she's talking about how she's actually leveraging social media tools and help teaching students how to use them to help manage their lives. And this is a pretty lively post. And if you've met Catherine, you'd understand why. And she's got lots of great tips and tools in here to share with you all. So take a look here um, on your own and read what she has to share with us. And we have a question, which I think is a fabulous one that Pat shared. And she says she's trying to imagine what could be done with Google Goggles. Um, Pat, could you explain to us what Google Goggles is for the? My, if my thing wasn't so dead battery, I would have demonstrated it. But it's a Google app for the Droid, and it uses the camera. And you, um, it's, it's a regular app. You get your app, you use the camera, and you photograph, and it scans, and it it gets that image, and then it goes and searches by the photo for relevant material on the web. So the obvious one that I know about is you could take a picture of an artwork in site that didn't have very much information, and it'll probably find that artwork and give you a bunch of information, but what else could we do with this? Scanning something and having it be recognized, not verbally, but visually. So it's an app for, for, the, for, the, droid. for the droid that essentially takes photographs and interprets the visual information and then does a web search based upon what it yeah. sees. Right which is weird to say. <laughs> so the question is, how can we use that for learning beyond taking a photograph of an artwork? Um, but that in itself, I think, is amazing because then you can analyze what it retrieves, right, and interpret the information, which leads into a really interesting conversation about information in the digital age. But who has an idea? I'm sure someone here has one. Yes. We've, my students just used it today. Yeah. Yeah, we're working with some hardware in my engineering class. Oh. Okay. And we needed the specs for the motor. Okay. A picture of the motor, the, the emblem of the, of the manufacturer, mm -hmm. and just came up the specs. Oh, wow. wow. And what class was that in? Huh? Engineering. So, and what is your name? It's all in Dagua. I have class Sorry. right now, that's so why I can't be here. But. Oh, well, thank you for sharing. Perfect timing. So, in his engineering class, they took a picture uh, to get the specs for a certain piece of equipment and, and they took a picture of it. Wow. That's, that's pretty wonderful. Hmm. Yeah, my mind is just racing right now trying to think of other applications. One thing, another thing that I know it does is it will translate uh, a word or, you know, from one language to another using a Google Translate. So if you take a picture of some foreign text, language, it doesn't do very well with Asian characters, but it did fine with French and German when I tried it. So you can take and a photograph of foreign text, text and it will actually translate it into to multiple languages. Right. 
So we all just and we travel <laughs> in silence. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah, road signs. And this app is not for the iPhone. No, it's just it's oh. a Google. I, I don't know. Mine's, I, no, I don't no. know. It, is there one for the iPhone? I don't know. I'm not sure if it's been updated. We'll check that out. Rachel will check that out if it works on an iPhone. Yeah. I think it has an application if you were teaching consumer education. Um, I, this, I've used it in a department store. I scan a barcode. I was trying to comparison shop mattresses. You, you can scan a barcode and it will tell you what you're looking at, how much it is, and then you can look at other places that sell it for price comparison. Yeah. So I think it would have a consumer Red education Red application. Red Lady. Red Lady. Red Lady. Yeah. To confirm, the um, Google is available to the Google mobile app. It's mm -hmm. part of the, uh, it shows your mail, your uh, calendar, and all that. Yeah. So it's part of the Google so app. app. It's, newly added to the it's app. part of the. It's been newly added to the Google app, which will run on an iPhone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. That's good to know. Something to play with. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was fun. See the great ideas that come out of just asking a question. So, um, yes. Let yeah, me ask you one thing about editing posters because if Pat's name were up there, that would be great. I can, I can add that. So I'm the owner of the site, so I, I, I don't know, actually. If, I don't think, I wonder if you can edit your own. Okay, well, I can go in and, and, and add your name to that. I'd be happy to do that if you'd like me to do that. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. And I can edit anything else. If you're concerned about something going wrong with Posteris, and no worries, I'll delete something if you want me to delete it. I'll add it. It's, this is not about you know being right and wrong. This is all about play and exploration. So another thing, when I opened posters at first on my Droid, it was in a mobile format, and I couldn't. I found it very hard to find out how do I get to the current post. It, it had agenda maybe they're just more fit. I think that those were the posts oh. so yes that's the way so that the view of it in mobile is very different it's it's not visual it's very text based but it's it is functional yeah so anything embedded in posterus on the full the web version will just appear as little icons in the mobile version it's it's not quite as dynamic and and visual but it does function okay so I'm going to stop sharing the app here, and um, we'll move back to our presentations. And next up we have Rupa, is it Mather? Mather, who is here to speak with us. Um, Rupa is from Irvine Valley College, and she's going to share with us um, a little bit of information about using course access and communication, increasing course access and communication with Blackboard Mobile Learn, which is an application that maybe you don't know about or you haven't tried and if you teach with Blackboard it could be something that could be very helpful. So come on over and share your thoughts with us. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everybody. My name is Arupa Mather. Um, as Michelle said, I work at Irvine Valley College. I'm a professor of information systems management and I teach a lot of different classes. Right now I teach a lot of web design classes and Adobe Creative Suite stuff. So I wanted to share with you um, Blackboard Mobile Learn. Just from a show of hands, how many people here use Blackboard in their classrooms? So we have about five, six people that use Blackboard. Great. And how many of you use maybe a different course management system? How many of you use eCollege? Anybody for eCollege? I'm actually a student as well because I'm working on my PhD through Walden University and Walden Online University uses eCollege. They also have a similar, a similar mobile app available. Um, are there any other course management systems that any of you are using right now? Google, okay. Moodle, that's right. Do they have a, um, a mobile app for that yet? Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. So um, what she said was they're using Moodle, and I'll look into whether they have a mobile app for that. But a lot of the other course management systems, a big one, of course, is Blackboard. And Zach has chimed in. He uses Desire to Learn, and it has a mobile component. Oh, yes. Desire to Learn does, too. Wonderful. Thank you, Zach, for contributing to that. Um, so I'll show you just a little bit about Blackboard Mobile Learn and how it works.
So the first thing you need to do is figure out whether uh, you have Blackboard Mobile Learn available at your institution. A simple way to kind of test that out is to go ahead and download the app from the App Store. Just look up Blackboard Mobile and the app comes up. And then once you download the app, go ahead and run the app from your iPod. And once you open up the app, you simply search for your institution. Now, all the time, it doesn't necessarily find exactly what you're looking for. For example, I work at Irvine Valley College, but the account is under my district name. So it's under South Orange County Community College District. So that's something that we need to educate our students on um, when they go look for it. But once you're in, then you're, you're into Blackboard Mobile. Because Blackboard Mobile, you need to have a course. And if you're an instructor and you have Blackboard access, you have a course in Blackboard. So all of those students um, have access to your website and your website alone. That's one of the reasons why I really love Blackboard is because only my students get access to my particular course. I might be teaching three or four or five different classes every semester, but only the students who are enrolled in that class will get access. So they have to log in. There's authentication, and that's, that's for your protection, too. Um, then it will list all the courses that the students are taking through Blackboard. Um, this is actually a sample from one of our other instructors there, um, but these are all the courses that he's teaching. This app is available not only for students, but for faculty as well. So you just click on the course number that you want to take, and it goes into the app. And if you're familiar with Blackboard or any other course management system, you know that they have several menus. For example, they'll have an announcement, they'll have a syllabus, and maybe course documents, assignments, discussion board, stuff like that. Those are replicated in this mobile application. So I'll just go through some of these to show you how similar it is to the web-based Blackboard Learn. So let's say that you click on syllabus. It'll actually pull up your syllabus. Um, this syllabus is, is in the HTML format, so it pulls it up very quickly. If you have it in PDF format, it'll pull it up as well. Um, some of these you'll notice, and I'll, I'll tell you when, but some of these will actually go out to the web. So it's actually going to go out and actually download it from the actual site. And some are built right in. So very easy, you know, if, the, if a student is walking around and they're up and about, um, they can quickly look at your syllabus, see what your office hours are, and know why you're not there. So, <laughs> If you want to go back to the main page, which what I call, which is the course map, they have that menu down at the bottom left corner, and it just takes you back. The discussion board is something that I find very useful, especially for mobile devices. Um, when students are not these days, they're not always in front of a computer. They're not always in front of a laptop. But you know what? Most of the students now do have smartphones. And if they have any kind of smartphone, they have availability to this app. They can quickly look at the announcements for the day. In my classrooms, I make sure I post something at least every few days so that there's something new and refreshing that they need to do or they need to look at. I always post reminders about homework so they have no excuse to be late if I've posted that, hey, homework's due today. 11. Discussion board is a great area for them to look at because I open up discussions for usually one week. So I might have, okay, this week we're going to talk about this. And so they might be anywhere on campus or, or off campus and they might be looking at the discussions and chiming in. So they would simply just click on the discussion of the week. And they can see um, all the different questions or forums that I've posted. And then if they want to add their own thread, which I make it a requirement that they have to at least add their thread before they can respond to the other um, posts that are already up there, they simply click Add Thread and pick whichever one that they want to look at. And then at the bottom, it, the Add Post shows them that they can just type in whatever they want. They can respond to the other students. And you can see the other students' postings there and they can add to their posts. So this is something that they can actually do, and they love to do the discussion boards on their mobile phones. Some of the other things that they can do is look at the assignments. Um, some of the assignments may just have 
okay, you need to research this and write a paper about it or they might have something that they actually have to do. I find that a lot of the students will not actually do the assignments, but they will read the assignments online to, okay, what is it that I have to do? Um, the other thing is that for the assignments, you might have a quiz. Um, I don't know how many students will actually take a quiz on their mobile phone, but sometimes I have my quizzes opened up that they can take it numerous times and I can see them actually doing those kind of quizzes because I just do it for their learning. And um, I can see them doing that kind of quiz on their mobile phones as well. This app is called the Blackboard Mobile Learn app and it's available on basically all the platforms. So it depends on your institution. If your institution has a full license for Blackboard, then Blackboard does not charge any extra for this app. It kind of comes with the main contract. So ours is actually going to go into effect um, in January, and the app is going to be available on all platforms for all mobile devices. And that's, that's really cool. So we're really looking forward to that. Here's just some screenshots I show of um, it working on the Android, the BlackBerry, the iPad, and of course the iPhone as well. Rupa, are you talking about Blackboard 9.1? Yes. And because we're on WebCT still. I mean, it's owned by Blackboard, but that's you have a, to make that clear. That's a wonderful comment. Uh, the comment was, am I talking about Blackboard 9.1 or older versions like WebCT or Blackboard 7? We were actually on a really old Blackboard, Blackboard 7, and we just upgraded to 9.1. So that is correct. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, any other questions about this particular app, you can go to this link here. It's blackboard.com slash mobile and mobile dash learn. I want to just briefly tell you about one other Blackboard app that you might hear about that's slightly different than this one. There's a Blackboard Mobile Central app. And the Blackboard Mobile Central app is an app that basically tells you a couple of things about your university or college. Number one, it'll tell you what the um, news is. Number two, it'll show the class schedule. Number three, it'll show you the directory. So it'll have you know, all the faculty directory of, of your district or your college. And um, it'll also have a campus map. So those, that application called Blackboard Mobile Central is a separate application than this. That was originally developed by Stanford, and it was called iStanford, and the students at Stanford, there were like four of them that developed this company called Terribly Clever, and they developed that app, and Blackboard just bought them out last year. And um, so that's a really wonderful app, and we're, we're hoping to launch that in January as well. Are there any questions? Yeah, how long does it take you to put together a the information that you need and then stick it into this Blackboard? Uh, the question is, how long does it take for me to take the information that I have in a Blackboard course and stick it in so that it's available to in Blackboard Mobile Learn? And the answer is zero minutes. I do not, as an instructor, have to do anything extra. What I have uploaded to the Blackboard, mobile, the Blackboard um, course from my PC is exactly what shows up here automatically. So they reformat it? Um, they do whatever they need to do, but I'm telling you, they don't reformat it. So whatever you have up there will display just fine, um, you know, except like flash stuff. But, <laughs> but yeah, everything looks just fine. Um, all my links and, yeah, everything just works. Is the new black, newer Blackboard um, from QCC also, is it easy? Because I've, I've had difficulty with the HTML pages. I kind of, it takes me so long, it's so awkward to use that I just usually just do straight text and I wouldn't bother with HTML anymore. I'm with you. Um, Blackboard 9.1, the question was, um, is it better with HTML, um, to do like an HTML page? versus uploading like a document or in simple text. I actually teach web design and I teach an entire course in just HTML where they have to use notepad and create web pages with HTML. But coming from that background, I do not use HTML on Blackboard. It's horrible. So I just use simple text. Such a waste of time. I agree.
I agree. I just use simple text. And, you know, if I need a link, I'll put a link in. But, yeah, simple text works pretty well. I mean, and it's probably better for the mobile anyway, because if you create a fancy HTML page, it may or may not display very well on the mobile device. Um, that's true, but I... Right, right. Um, so the question is, HTML pages may not display as well either. I really don't know because my, my pages for my courses do, happen to display just fine. And even the demo courses that I've gone through, they seem to do just fine on, on the mobile devices too. And what's cool about this, I think, is now the iPad app is there. And I actually have students in my classes now, instead of bringing in laptops, they bring in their iPad. And so they can follow along the lectures or the handouts or whatever I'm doing in class with Blackboard on their iPad. So that's very interesting. So I hope you guys go home and try it. And I wanted to tell you um, the price because, you know, there's always a cost involved in everything. This one's free. Your district pays for it, so. Oh, one more thing to add. Um, well, I guess I've used Blackboard at PCC for two years now, and I had a, a trip to New York. So I decided, because of the point we were in the course, that they really needed a lot of tech support. So Laura and I uh, set up a a chat room. So I had no idea what kind of questions they were going to ask. It was very, very technical um, animation. But so I had no idea who was in the room. It was open, and, and who was at home. So we, we literally had a virtual classroom, you know, where people, you know, it, it, it looked like that. Um, and I could have done the, the whiteboard as well um, and, you know, presented slides, but it was more like they were working, asking questions. And I don't know, Laura, it seemed like they, it helped in terms of support. Yeah, so, that's a wonderful comment. So the comment you made freedom to give them a resource when I wasn't there. So I didn't know if it was going to work. But, um... So you use the virtual chat feature, right, in Blackboard? Yeah, the virtual chat feature is a great feature in Blackboard. What it allows you to do is to kind of open it up and, um, for example, I might say, okay, Saturday morning between 10 and 12, I'm going to be available on the virtual chat. If you guys have any questions, chime in. So it's kind of like office hours without being in your office. And they can ask you any questions they want. If you want, you can just tailor the discussion to a particular topic. And kind of like um, Illuminate Live is you can see who's on. You can see who's there. They can type in their, their chat just like this. Um, you can even show them on the screen what you're looking at. So, for example, I might draw something and hand draw it and say, well, this is what you need to be doing rather than this. So it's, it's a great feature of Blackboard. We have a question from Catherine. Oh, wonderful. Um, so the question is, I think you may have said this at the beginning, but is this only available on Blackboard 9? Correct. Um, the answer is, I'm not sure. I think it's only available with Blackboard 9 because with previous versions, we did not have it at my district. And we just upgraded to Blackboard 9.1 and we, it just became available, and um, so I believe that's correct. <laughs> I have a question, um, and I'm just kind of curious. I'm thinking about Blackboard, recent, their recent acquisition of Illuminate, mm -hmm. um, which is actually the mm -hmm. web conferencing system that we're using here, and I'm wondering, if, has anyone heard anything about a mobile app for Illuminate? Mm -hmm. So the question is, has anybody heard about a mobile app for Illuminate? Um, because CCC Confer uses that. No, no. It will happen. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it will happen. And what we were saying earlier was that this, um, the Illuminate Live looks very, very familiar to the visual chat feature that Blackboard already has incorporated in it. So. Over the, and, over the summer, um, I. I was listening, I attended a web conference that was conducted through Adobe Connect. And they had, there's an app for Adobe Connect. And so I was actually able to, I took an afternoon walk and I just had my iPhone and I was able, I didn't, wasn't, I didn't participate, but I was able to listen to a live web conference while I was out going around. This is the coolest thing ever. So um, I was just excited to kind of put these two pieces together and think about something like this going mobile as well. 
Um, so Michelle was just sharing that, that she was walking around and she downloaded this app for Mobile Connect and she was able to participate and uh, listen in, Adobe Connect, excuse me, and able to listen in and uh, hear the web conference. So that's, that's pretty cool. I'm sure it's coming. I'm sure something mobile like this is coming. I was wondering how many people use Acrobat.com, which is somehow connected to that, right? Because we've, we've also used that in the classroom. Yeah, um, I'm not a big Adobe user. Very similar things. Um, yeah, um, I'm a little bit familiar with, um, with Acrobat.com. The problem is that it costs money, right? To, to Oh, it's free. That's, yeah. It's free. If you want to have like a huge conference, then there's a free Then there's a cost, free. yeah. But we did it in my classroom. Um, Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rupa. That was great. And you have applause from Catherine and Zach who are hanging in there. Love it. Love it. Okay. So I am going to click to, let's see. So Sue Brown was supposed to be here tonight, but she got ill and wasn't able to make it. I got a text from her just as we were starting up tonight. So um, we will miss her um, her presentation tonight. Sue did take some time earlier today to summarize her idea and post it to Posteris. So you can at least chime in and, and read a little bit about how she's using Google Groups to create mobile student learning communities in her classes. So we wish her a quick recovery. So we're going to have um, Sandra C. Haynes join us now and Sandra um, is on the faculty here at Pasadena City College and she's going to talk about increasing student engagement in the classroom with poll everywhere. Welcome Sandra. So it's interesting that there are so many artists and art historians here tonight um, and in fact I'm another person who got into VoiceThread because of Michelle. Um, I tend to be a very cognitive learning assessment kind of person, but VoiceThread is fabulous um, for associative kinds of assignments. It's, uh, it's great, so I wanted to make that connection. Um, starting about six or seven years ago, uh, much like the rest of you, I, I began warning my 120 students, we teach really large surveys here at PCC, um, that they needed to turn off their mobile devices. You remember when you had to start doing that and you really weren't sure how it was going to work. It usually didn't work all that well. Turn off your beepers, turn off your cell phones. And I wasn't really mean about it. Um, I, in fact, I tried to make it a joke. The only reason I would say to my students that you have to have an activated mobile device is to enable notification that a kidney or a heart had become available for immediate <laughs> transplant uh, for you and and of course they laughed but at least they remembered that this teacher doesn't want um, anything beeping or anything uh, going off in the classroom but um, increasingly it just became apparent to me um, that uh, the more majority of my students were bringing cell phones to class and uh, I was telling them to put them away and turn them off even when they might not bring a pen or pencil to sign the roll sheet. They had their cell phones and some even told me that they were in fact taking notes when I was sure they were texting. <laughs> I'm taking notes. Um, so um, I had to try to be more interactive in terms of the learning experience to integrate this 
mobile device. Um, I disrupted my traditional thinking about learning as well as that of the individual student by incorporating, starting to incorporate technology. And this is in face-to-face. -face. I, I also teach fully online. Um, so my students were literally, I loved it, stunned the first time I said to them, take out your cell phones. And, and uh, they were absolutely stunned. And um, the thing that I started with um, was actually, I, I started with um, um, Poll Everywhere, but I also um, last year tried using Academic Connect, and Rachel and I were doing it. This is like a learn beta testing a, a learning management system on a much lesser scale than Blackboard. And what I found out then, and I don't know if you've had this experience, is that although most of my students have cell phones, have mobile devices, they do not have access to the internet. Did you know that? So most of them have a cell phone, so they have the ability to text, but when I said, well, we're going to do stuff through the internet, I realized probably they couldn't afford that extra aspect of, of having a cell phone. And I would say only a third of my students had an internet connection. So Poll Everywhere became my solution to trying to get um, feedback because they usually all, 100% of them, have a texting um, ability. So um, I, here we are, um, polleverywhere.com. And I'm just very briefly, I did put up a, a tutorial that someone else did and was posted um, on YouTube, on educational YouTube, so you can have a look at that. Um, uh, but I, I just want to show you how basically um, easy this web-based polling service is. It was launched in 2007. Um, it may be something you've heard of before or haven't used. It's much more mundane than most of the things people have been talking about tonight, but it's really easy, and that's why I like it. So um, you do need to create an account. It's very easy um, to do so. It gives you kind of minimal access, but it's enough. 32 students uh, can reply. This means when I tell my students, okay, we're going to do a, a poll, an interactive poll, they rushed they rush to get their phones out to be one of the 30 because obviously they'll be cut up. Number 31 won't get uh, an answer in. So even though they're not getting points or credit, they want to get their, uh, their answer in uh, to the poll. Um, so uh, I am going to, I'm going to log in. Oh, that's so tiny. So Sandy, are you logging in? So if you have access to project the internet in your classroom, is there a way for you via your phone as faculty to get a summary of this information? Or you have to have a smartphone or for for me? Yeah. So if I if we didn't have internet? Right, right. Right. Um, I wouldn't be able to use it because I have to get to the site. I wouldn't be able to use it in as interactive a way. However, there is a way to download um, the poll and um, uh, embed it into a PowerPoint or a keynote. Um, and so that, I'm not going to show you that. So, um, okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create um, a new poll here. Uh, and um, you notice, basically, you, there are two kinds of questions you can ask, a multiple choice question and a free text poll. Um, if you want to do more, you have to go into um, a slightly more um, advanced um, account, and it can be expensive, but it really is just fine. Um, you know, the, the um, a free educator's account. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a free text poll. And I do want you to get out your mobile devices. <laughs> I'm going to try a question here. Let's see if this works at all. OK, I typed it in going to save it. It's really fast. This is what you can do with students. It's immediate. If you see they didn't get something, then you're going to ask them right away, okay? What were we just talking about, right? And then we're going to get... So I'm asking you what happy face widget can transport you to the best and funniest content on the web? And, oh, sorry. 
um, ways that people can respond. I'm going to, you notice that they automatically do or default to text messaging and web voting. I'm going to do Twitter and smartphone. Uh, they don't have touch tone dialing or email um, yet. Uh, but you can see now I've given you more options. So you can text um, and then um, put in um, the number 37607 and then put in what your answer would be. So I'm going to try to get in there too. Does anyone have any ideas? Um, you, you text um, 40994, that's two, and then in the um, text box, you put in 37607, which is going to direct you to our poll, to our question, and then put in the answer. Zach says he was the first one in there. First, I went with the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, that's probably the fastest. Okay, question mark with a happy face and a wink. Thank you. That's probably Catherine, right? And you know what? I, I hate to tell you all this, but my students are so fast. <laughs> what it is is you have to type, you, type, you put in the uh, 37607, uh, put in the 40994 space, and in your answer. That's what I did. Yes. That's what I did. I was and they didn't know. Oh, so the four, so no that was in the, okay. I need to do this. Yeah, yeah you need to figure that out. So space, space and then Space and then put in your answer. Cool. Mm -hmm. I've got one. That's my answer. You know the boredom button? No? The what? It's called the boredom button. Uh, never heard of it. Never heard of it. I tried to tweet my answer, says Catherine. Am I reading it correctly? Yes, it's at poll 40994. And they have a space there? There is a space there. That's, it looks like there's a space, yes. And then and you put another space after that. Yeah. Did you get a second no clue? No, didn't get a second no clue. Was that you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now there is a way to monitor responses. Obviously you're, you have to trust your class, uh, but you actually have to have um, um, uh, the more advanced. There we go. What's a happy face widget? <laughs> Okay. Well, I would go to it and show it to you, but I don't want to mess up what Michelle has here. Hi, Rachel. Who did that? <laughs> okay. So now I want, I'm going to go to my polls, and we're going to try one more. And here it is. You can see you can set up questions ahead of time. You can put them into groups. Yeah, or you can do it. I love just throwing one in there, right? You know, right when they're with you. But um, I put this one in earlier, and now that we've all been so successful, <laughs> with poll everywhere. It, it's I will definitely try out poll everywhere. So again, you can text, you can tweet, um, you can go um, on the internet.
and tell me, yes, maybe, probably not, or I already do. So let's see, and then you're going to see the results start coming up. One person says yes. Uh, yes is 133021. All kinds of great conversations and feedback can go on with students once they start to see um, the answers, especially when they're giving you answers and um, they can um, you know, help each other realize that's the wrong answer. You're confusing that with something else. Um, it's, uh, it's just been a great tool. Can you read it? Yes is 133021. Um, you do the texting. You have to put in the, the code. So I put 37607 and then the yes code. And then text it to and then put it into the little text box, put the code into the text box. Put the code into the text box. Zach has a um, comment there about what they do at, at his school. Um, Zach says he encourages students to take responsibility for their rhetorical choices. <laughs> And he knows that it has an effective practice. No, just, just do it when I've used with faculty. When I've used this with faculty, one best practice we found is to have students include at least their first name. Yes. Yes. And in fact, there is a way, again, with um, the, th this can be very expensive if you upgrade your account. There is a way of identifying every student. Yes. Do you use the free version? So yes, I use the free version. And I think that that will work for up to 32. Right, up to 32 now, right. That, that's why I tell them, you know, if there are 100 students there, you better get yours in or you won't be counted. And they're just, they're going like crazy. <laughs> or they'll work together so two of them at least will get one, um, one answer in. So I'm, I'm a, any other questions? Yes. Um, you could you could uh, embed this into PowerPoint or to Keynote. Does it pull everywhere? Do they have the instructions on that? They do. They do. They have some good tutorials. Um, and you, you can. And I actually was doing that this afternoon. You can see right here. Download is a slide. Okay. Keynote PowerPoint. So same. If you're tweeting, it's just at poll and one of those numbers. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. I find that's easier than that. But that mine didn't show up because yeah, I tried to do it. Probably not. And it didn't register. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Who said maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Is it really? But it's, but mine keeps saying. Um, Unable to receive message. Message blocking is active. Do you, are any of you guys? I keep getting served. And you can only you can only um, answer the question one time. Because that's one of the yeah. defaults. If you want to be able to, to, oh, to yes. put in, yes. right, yeah. If you want to be able to have students do it more, you have to change that. Yeah. So, um, See, that ways people can respond. Um, Zach says, in, um, we've also used this on info screens throughout the campus. And it works particularly well for in-class test review and group report out. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Are you tired of waiting in line? Yes. <laughs> OK, any other questions? So use it. It's really easy. I hardly explained anything, and you were just uh, doing a great job. Okay, that was fantastic. I'm excited too. More applause. Really fun stuff. So um, raise your hand if you took at least one good idea away from this workshop. All right. I think, I think it's unanimous. <laughs> so that was our last presenter tonight. I would like to know if there's anyone else who would like to share something off the cuff. 
um, an idea that maybe you're simmering on that now that we're now that we're all one big happy family you may feel a little bit more comfortable come on up coming on up and, and sharing something with us and we will offer a $50 iTunes gift card for doing that yeah um, can I share I'll, I'll share one that Pat showed me okay yeah. come on up I think I want to get a $50 gift card but I would like <laughs> so have you got I've been using delicious since I was introduced to delicious the bookmarks and I found that it's just this fantastic can I go online or not or absolutely let me pull it up for you keep talking and I'll just pull it up so delicious is this way of making bookmarks um, that you can put into the toolbar Pat showed me Pat showed me this and I've just taken to it like a duck to water and then Michelle solved my problem about how to share a group of bookmarks that I've been taking to a whole class and to be able to send it send it to a group so these are this. yours no these this are... is just the home page oh, okay. I'm not logged in I, oh wait am I oh I am logged in I'm always logged in let me um, <laughs> log out I'm also a delicious addict and do you have it on your? I do. Do you have yeah, it I have on the there? Toolbar in there? Yeah. So just if you haven't if you haven't seen it before, I'm going. I I sign you know I sign in. Oops, I'm not going to do this brilliantly. I've always already got a Yahoo um, account, so I can sign in with my Yahoo account. I didn't need to make anything new. Sorry, I won't sign in as you, Michelle. Um, let me remember my password. Never. <laughs> and then I've got a bunch, just a few tags. I've got just a few little mobile learning things I just started setting up. But for another workshop, we did one about social media. And I just, if I just type in here my word social, then it comes up with all the bookmarks that I have for that. And then if I want to share that with a class, all I have to do is, and this is what Michelle showed me, Pat showed me how to get all the bookmarks, which is I just copy this link, and then I just paste it into an email that I just send out to my whole class. And that's it. And then when they can, they can come on to Delicious, and they can go to all of these, any of these things that I've bookmarked. So it's a really nice way to be able just to share a whole bunch of links with a class. Then to make the bookmarks, what's cool about that is if we want to go to our posterous site, I can go in, and if I've loaded up, um, you can load into your toolbar. Is it up? Yeah, isn't it this it here? If I just click on this. Oh, no, little, little it's right by the this one? Oh, she's put it up here. Oh, oh it's a cool the place tag. to put it. Oh, oh, the wrong one, yeah. yeah. Let me go back. So I just hit this with my. Yeah, this one, thank yeah, you. See, thank you. So I just come in here, I put in my keyword that I want this to be, so I don't know, let's call this, I'll put this on social as well. And then I just hit save, and it's part of the, and I can like say whatever I want to say, but all oh, I'm, I'm not a power user of Delicious. But so then I, there's like the tags recommended when other people have tagged it, so you can kind of join in and vote for it. It's a mobile learning site, you can add it to and then it's like... In that little box, there's also a little checkbox that says mark it private. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. So if you have something that you want to tag, but you don't want to show up in your public bookmarks, you just mark it private. And I've got a bunch of sort of mix of things I want to share with a class, and then things I'm just collecting for myself. So the ones that are for myself, I just mark private, and then the ones that I want to share with like groups of students, I'll just leave them open as public. And that, that to me, is just a really fast, quick way of being able to share a whole lot share a whole lot of things and it's 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 because when you have it in the toolbar like that it's so easy to just tag it as a bookmark so anyway that was my so any website that I go to so I don't know what's a cool website to go to right now I don't know um, the what is it Mice with uh, two genetics. Oh, I love my dog. <laughs> that is, I've got to share that. So I just hit tag, decide what I'm going to put on it. I'm going to call this a set of funny tag. And then I'm going to hit save. And then if I want to go back, if I want to see the next one that the boredom button is going to give me, no, Pirates of the Caribbean. 
Or are you going to demo something? Okay. Well, uh, just web based, sure. so you can just, yeah. and this works or this works, whatever okay. you prefer. Um, and introduce yourself. I'm David Simon. How are you guys doing? David. Um, my intent was really just to get the $50 gift certificate, but <laughs> so I was like really trying to figure out what I could really help out with. Um, anybody familiar with Doodle? Anybody have used Doodle? Okay. Uh, Doodle is a great tool, and, and a lot of you guys can probably use it. Um, I'm fairly new to it, so. I'll just kind of show you what it is. But what it does is it helps you schedule. And you can put it in the hands of your students to do this. Instead of coming up with a, a grid, if you need to do any office time or whatnot, you can just have them schedule, and they'll see exactly what's available. So um, it's pretty simple. And uh, so you can just basically just schedule an event, and you kind of put your information down. And let me just show you the end product. And you can list all your students over on one side. Um, and the green is where they've chosen to, you know, whatever you're scheduling, if it's office time or whatnot. Um, and this is it's just so simple. You're just putting it in their hands instead of you're trying to schedule everything yourselves. So you just make what times you're available, and, and they can just start click selecting what they want. And it's all organized here. It's, um, mo it's every platform. People can do it on their iPhones as well. It's available. So um, very simple, and it's a good, easy tool. So, so what that interface looks like is um, the in-between, that step mm -hmm. one and this step. Right, this, there's about two more steps. I mean, yeah. once you start entering, you, you basically have to email all your people that you want to uh, have fill in. But it pretty much it's all user-friendly. And user so they get email and, with the link, they go to mm -hmm. the link, and it just says enter your name. And then it says, like, for example, all the times across the time, and you just click on the ones that you're available, and then it accumulates it in with the, net, the previous person. So they don't have to sign in. Right. Which is something they just click on the link. They'll send a link. It's just an email that your, you know, student or, or friend or whatnot receives, and they just click on it and, and select the time that they want to visit. So it's very easy. All right. Thank you for sharing. Um, Doodle. Doodle is really fantastic for scheduling things. I mean, even outside of teaching, um, for scheduling meetings, like when you're trying to schedule a group of people for a meeting and you're thinking, instead of saying, oh, send me an email and let me know when you're available, right? You just create a doodle pool and say, okay, well, are you available on Wednesday at 1, on Tuesday at 10, on Thursday at 5? And you list those things, send it out to the people, and 
you know, give them a deadline and then you pay, say, okay, well, the most people are available then and so this is when we're going to do it and it resolves all those, those problems. Um, I'm actually using Doodle right now to try to organize a family reunion. So <laughs> lots of uses for it. It's, it's a great tool. I'm glad you shared that one. Okay, um, I have one thing that I'm going to share that, that I shared at Mobile Ed. And the only reason I'm going to repeat this, and this is going to be something that some of you have already heard, but I've just heard from so many people that it, it sparks some ideas for them. And it's really super simple. It doesn't even involve an app. Um, and it was the example that I gave about teaching art history with, um, with the cell phone. And so I think that sometimes when we're in a classroom environment, we still, um, at least I think it's very natural for us to kind of slip into and, and that mode of, you know, relaying and telling information. And as we move into this kind of constructivist mode of teaching and getting our students actively involved and in, in gathering information and sorting through information and kind of putting them in an in inquiry, process of inquiry in their learning, um, it's great to think about how we can not tell them something but have them go through a process to get to the same realization. And uh, one example I want to use is my history of women in art class. And um, it's a, of course, everyone says it's a wonderful class when you're the one teaching it. But one of the first things we talk about in that class is, hey, there are very few women artists that are remembered in history. Now, that's a really easy thing to say. But it's a much more powerful thing to get students to realize that on their own. And so what I did in my class was I had my students take out their cell phones. And I said, I want you to call two people that you know and ask them to name three famous artists. And write down the names of those famous artists, the th top three that come to their mind. And of course, they all looked at me um, like I was crazy. Who was it that, that shared that? To, when you tell them to take out their cell phones, but Sandra, it was you. Yeah. Like, I was crazy. You want me to use my cell phone? And you want me to call someone in your class? And, and that was a great moment in itself. And this was literally, like, the second day of class. So it was a great way to start the term and to know that, you know, we're going to do something different here. And so they made those phone calls, and they jotted down the names of the famous artists, you know, and it was rambunctious there for a few minutes. And then they came back together with this tremendous amount of energy. And so then we started listing the names of the artists. And... And guess what? <laughs> you know, there were, I think, one or two women, and they were the same women artists that got repeated over and over again. And so that gave us an opportunity to have a conversation about that and kind of come to this, 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 um, this notion all on their own rather than just having me tell that to them. Um, so that's just one example, I think, of, you know, I think oftentimes there are, there are lots of ideas that we teach that we can have students kind of reach those, those that, that, not, that level of knowledge on their own in some other kind of active learning fashion. So, so think about even using cell phones to make calls and um, get information in that way as well. Well, we are at 9.30, and it's a little bit early to wrap up, but um, I'm happy to have a little bit more discussion, or I bet you're all wiped out and ready to run home and... <laughs> And, and keep brainstorming. I would like to say thank you for everyone to everyone uh, who participated tonight, who showed up. I know that this is an exhausting time of the year for many reasons, especially when we're on a campus together. Um, and you are all so dedicated for being here. I'd like to applaud all of you and to Catherine and Zach who are still hanging on there remotely. We will be sending out an evaluation for the workshop tonight via email. Is that where, okay? So if you could please complete that evaluation. So it's always very important uh, for the organizers to understand how your experience went and how we could make it better next time. And I also wanted to share the Mobile Ed 10 Ning site. Um, Mobile Ed 10, again, was the conference held here at Pasadena last year, last April. And we created a Ning social network community. And that is still available. And you can go there and join. A lot of you are already members. Uh, it's a great way to kind of connect with some of the presenters here tonight or some other people um, who are here tonight and just stay in touch without having to exchange emails or anything like that. So if you go to www.mobileed10.ning.com and sign up for the site, we will approve your membership and um, you can stay connected that way. And that's the QR code that would get you there, yes. Yes. The, the QR code, if you take a picture of it, if you've got a QR code reader on your um, cell phone, take a picture of it and it will take you to the website address. Yeah, QR codes are 
whole other fun topic with mobile learning. Um, okay, yeah, so Catherine said, so cool, just scan that QR code on my droid. All right, Catherine, I told you she was. Yes, yes, you're right, Zach, it was George Rookie. <laughs> you're good, you're good. <laughs> And um, again, everyone, thank you. It was fantastic. I enjoyed being here and lots of great ideas. And I'd just like to say thank you to Michelle, who just put enormous amount of effort into organizing this for us tonight. I really appreciate you coming with new down things. All the way down. Yeah, it was, it was fun. Really it was fun.